Roll for Crit is made possible thanks to the support of viewers like you and our patrons on our Patreon page. You can become a patron for just $1 a month at patreon.com slash rollforcrit. Welcome to Roll for Crit. We are here at Gen Con Online, and by here I mean in, in a virtual space, uh, which could be anywhere. But today we are talking to Stefan Brissot and Eric Vogel over at Yellow Games, and we are specifically hoping to talk, and I think we'll get that chance, I, I, feel, I feel confident about it, uh, to both of them about the new game Katara, which Eric is the designer of. So why don't we start there, if you could give us an overview of what Katara is, what, what style of game it is and how it plays. Sure. So Katara is a, uh, I guess you would call it a medium light dudes on a map game, uh, building your empire. Um, every turn you uh, draft a card to add new abilities to your empire, get more movement, get more units. Um, and then you spend the next turn, you spend uh, the rest of the turn expanding your empire on the board. Uh, so we have uh, three different kinds of units in the game. Uh, if you look behind me, you can see the cool meeples for those different types of units. Um, yeah. And so some me uh, some units help you score victory points, make certain territories worth victory points. Some units uh, give you victory points when they engage in combat. Uh, some units help you uh, support your cards so you can keep more cards uh, in your empire. Uh, and so you play through the game like that. It's a very, uh, dynamic game in that, uh, every turn you need to expand your empire a lot during your turn. And then during the other players turns, you'll be contracted a lot. You'll shrink a great deal. Um, so mm -hmm. it means you, there's a, a lot of factors in the game that mean you really have to be aggressive in this game. You can't play defensively you can't just kind of dig into a few territories and hold on to that position because uh that drives me nuts in games i hate <laughs> conflict games where all of the incentive is for you to just be chicken and hang out in australia or, or <laughs> <laughs> burrow in in one corner um i try to make you know the thing that's fun in a fighting game is attacking so i try to give the players a lot of incentives to attack and what about the theme of this game? Where did uh, that come from? Is it actually based on existing mythology, or is this something you created all by yourself? Like, I'm really curious about that. Sure. Well, the uh, the original impetus to set it in pre-colonial Africa came from Yellow, came from the publisher. Uh, they were really interested in doing that, and I was uh, very enthusiastic about that. That's something I've um, really had an interest in doing. So then I did uh, most of the research into kind of the specifics of the setting. Uh, and so the Empire of Katara, it's, uh, it makes, to me, it makes the perfect game setting because it's kind of like the story of um, the Iliad. It sort of straddles the line between history and mythology. So there really was a um, empire in the Great Lakes region of Africa that um, I think the archaeological record calls the Chuezi Empire. And at the same time, there are myths associated with the Empire of Katara, which is essentially the, you know, that's more the mythological name, uh, such as the kings of the region having various magical abilities and properties. So uh, to me, that makes, and there's still a, um, a sort of an independent kingdom within, semi-independent kingdom within Uganda that's called Katara. It's called, I may be pronouncing this wrong, but Nyaro Katara. So it's something that's still kind of alive in uh, the culture today. Yeah, I know we were both specifically interested in the concept of a cheetah centaur, which is something that in Katara could. I, we were trying to wrap our heads around this. How uh, you know where exactly how that how those two things got got mushed together, uh, and what that represents in the game. Sure. Uh, so that I I can't really take credit for that. That was the artist's concept mm. um, uh, early on in the game. Uh, and so I don't know exactly what he was drawing from in creating that. But uh, while there aren't actually cheetah centaurs in any African mythology there that aren't. I know of, uh. there aren't as far as I know. Uh, but there certainly are, um, in different parts of Africa, there are certainly human-animal kind of hybrid creatures like the, uh, like the centaur. There's a sort of um, 
uh, I'm forgetting the proper name, but there's a man who has a hyena face on the back of his head. Uh, hmm. And so you, you talk to the front of him and you think he's a person and he turns around and he's got a hyena face there. And there's certainly um, in the local mythology, like most parts of Africa, there are uh, sentient animals in the mythology. That tends to be a common thing in African mythology. I was really curious if it did have an origin there because I was thinking about the name how – uh, cheetah centaur, like I was thinking, like shouldn't it be like? And I looked at the Latin for cheetah, like a jubitar, because <laughs> centaur would be for he, uh, like half horse, half human. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the that level may, of research we do here. I got you. That may be. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, I'm always excited kind of to learn about new mythical creatures. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I it's actually like jubitus, but I stopped at the T because I thought that would transition better. Uh, I'm sure someone who actually delves a bit more into mythology could do a little bit better with a, a, a more proper name. But I'm always interested in knowing if there's – because every time I'm like, oh, I think I know about all these mythical creatures. There's always a new one that get, pops into my v- field of view and it's like, guess what? This is from this area. I'm like, that's a fantastic myth. So, always Well, this, is, this is a novel myth. I think um, the original idea was more focused on sort of an Afro-fantasy game, sort of the equivalent of like Afro-sci-fi setting or Afro-futurism setting Mm. um and so the artwork had some of those elements from the beginning and i think um the the more we sort of honed in more on the um mythical or historical element as we went along Uh, you you mentioned you know uh coming bringing the game to yellow and uh, what they, their ideas were for the theme and stuff like that. Maybe, Stefan, could you speak to a little bit of uh, what the game was like the when you first saw it and how Yellow took it and maybe influenced the direction of it before its final product? Well, actually, I would love to, but and unfortunately, uh, I run the, the USA branch of uh, Yellow, and all the uh, work that Eric did he actually did ahead of time with the French team, with our R and D team. So, oh, really? Interesting. I actually the first time the first time I saw the game myself, it was already pretty advanced in that with that theme and that prototype. So I didn't I didn't see what the original mechanism that Eric brought to France was. But what I can speak of is um, the art the artist who designed uh, all the graphics for us is Miguel Coimbra. And uh, mm-hmm. we've done work with him before on um, uh, uh, Mountains of Madness. Mountains of Madness. Mm-hmm. That was the name. Was the <laughs> I love that game. Mountains of Madness. And, and I, that's another thing. Like, I, I love uh, when Miguel works on our game because he's such a multi facets artist. Uh, uh, if you look at the look and feel of Kita, right, it's very far from Mountains of Madness. And so I love the fact that. Miguel put himself in the in a mindset and said, okay, this is my vision for that world and that environment. And this is what... So, again, I don't know exactly what, how he came up with the Cheetah Center, but that's, that's one of the things. And also, I, I, working for Yellow, that's what I like, is the fact that we give uh, lots of... It, it, it's a very interesting dynamic from what I've witnessed from where I stand. We pitch our artists very clearly about what we have in mind. What Cedric is the the head of R and D in France, and he's a he's a visionary guy, and and he's behind all the great look of uh, of our products. And um, I I've seen some of his briefs, and they are very detailed about. What, but then they let the artists express themselves and come back with idea, and there is a very strong dialogue back and forth between the artist and the team. The same way, there is the same type of dynamic, and Eric can, Eric can speak to, to uh, in that sense, between our designer and our team. Like, um, as he says, he came with the, the engine of the game, and the R&D team said, okay, we would like to go in that direction. Therefore, Eric took upon himself to do the research, the background, the historical things, and all like he did a really good, deep job of documenting uh, to try to be as as loyal as possible to the myth and legend of uh, of Central Africa, um, and then came back to the R and D, and then the game started uh, creating, and so that's really the dynamic, and so that's I think that's one one of the reason why uh, the yellow catalog is so rich and and of quality. 
Um, it's a very frustrating part for me as the sales and marketing branch because we're always late. We're always behind on our schedule. Uh, half of the product don't look like what they sold me when they pitched me the other <laughs> time. But, but at the same time, it's also what makes us unique and give the, the, the creation of all those amazing games. So, uh, I, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Didn't no, mean no, to catch you. <laughs> um, um, Miguel's artwork is just beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. Um, it really yeah. evokes a setting. And for myself, you know, I look at, um, on the one hand, I'm pretty controlling as a creator. I have to own that about myself in some ways. But part of what I love about um, the work with the artist and the publisher is that making a game, it's not like painting a painting or writing a novel. It's really much more like making a film where there is this collaboration and there are these beautiful parts of the final product um, that would not have been there if I was the only creator working on it. You know, if I just could somehow project the art of, out of my head because I'm not that great an artist as anybody who's played one of the couple of my like early self-published games that I did the art for knows. <laughs> uh, somebody wrote that my original art for uh, Romans Go Home scared children. So I'm glad that, you know, the, the later edition... <laughs> Was so much, you know. The, that sounds like a compliment to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the point what I'm trying to achieve, you know, it's a horror <laughs> romance genre. <laughs> right, you know? right. But uh, the uh, the art he's done is so beautiful, and it introduces these ideas. You know, I think maybe the where the idea for the Cheetah Centaur came is that the original prototype, which went through a bunch of different themes, because I actually devi designed this game originally a while ago, um, mm -hmm. had. Um, camel meeples in it for those parts that are the cheetah centaurs now and the only reason there were camel meeples was because I needed three different kinds of meeples and I had a bunch of camels <laughs> <Wouldn't> camel <laughs> camel he gave me um, I never really meant them to be camels but I think maybe that just that may have just sparked the idea of creating an, uh, a part animal character I don't know uh, Miguel and I have never actually talked directly about the game um, which is another part of what makes the creative process interesting. There's that element of kind of telephone where you interact with each other through kind of third parties and, um, you know, it all just adds richness to the creative process. Um, the, but this game went through a bunch of themes as different publishers considered it for different times. And so hmm. um, mechanically, I would say, the game is the current game is probably about 80 percent the same as the game that i brought to yellow originally and then about 20 percent has been um uh them asking me to make certain changes for mechanical reasons and other changes to be a better fit with the new theme um, as well as some changes that i wanted to make in that direction so yeah i'm, I'm glad you brought up uh the art for sure because so, you know, Miguel is such a, an iconic uh, style and has done so many, uh, you know, big, recognizable games. And um, it must be a, it must be kind of an honor to have to have that uh, touch added to it. And yeah, it brings it brings a lot to it. And this is a great interview, by the way, because you guys are just like saying all the things that we wanted to ask you about. <laughs> we don't have to yeah. prompt you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you got like half our questions already. We're like, uh-oh, what, what else are we going to say? <laughs> yeah, I, I talk too much. It's uh... <laughs> Eric is a pro. I just come along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> it makes our jobs easier. <laughs> well, I mean, you covered a lot, like you said, uh, with, with the game. But we're also curious, do you have anything else from Yellow right now that maybe you could talk about? Uh, maybe from either of you, if you have maybe something secret as well, Eric, you have more games in Yellow's pipeline. Uh, yeah, we have also, well, to be completely honest with you, the, with the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, our release calendar has been all upside down. Like, uh, for example, like that that game here, Cora, uh, which is, uh, it's going to be a Euro game that we are, we are uh, releasing. That was supposed to be released at Essen. And since there is no longer Essen, uh, we decided that we're going to postpone that to next year. So mm. that's an interesting title because it's a, it's, a, it's a departure from what we are doing. It's much more dense uh, diplomacy, economical, euro type of product that 
we don't have anything similar in the yellow catalog at the moment as a yellow product. I mean, yellow in Europe is also a distributor. So we carry code names, we carry a lot of uh, other brand in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in as purely own brand for yellow, this is the, the most complicated game we are we are going to release. Um, then um, for the rest of the year, most of the catalog is uh, axed on uh, our friends at Scorpion Masque. So we are releasing um, Mia London, but it's a kid, it's a kid game that's coming mm-hmm. out uh, next month uh, of observation and matching. It's really cute. It has a little booklet of um, <laughs> of um, um, that little girl is an investigator and she's trying to figure out who done it. And so you have you are trying to make a a portrait robot. What do you call it? Like a face depiction of the culprit by right, flipping right, the. Sketch. A sketch, exactly. Mm-hmm. By flipping the little card on the on the booklet, uh, <laughs> they have a party game called Master World that's coming le- later this year. Also, uh, you are trying to guess a world by making uh, using other worlds. So, for example, the world you are trying to find is tiger, and so the only clue you have it's an animal, and then people are going to write world. So you're going to write, for example, mammal, land, and fish. Well, out of those three, only two works. It's mammal and land, but it's not a fish. It's a tiger. So the Mm -hmm. game master, a little bit like in a mastermind game, is going to say, well, two of those worlds are correct. And then you're going to do another Mm -hmm. round. And the worlds in the examples are main, predator, and fur. Predator and fur apply to tiger, but not main. So again, two. And so by process of elimination like that, you go to the next one is feline, spot slash stripes, jungle all three a match for the tiger and so then the player guess is it a panther no is it a tiger bingo so <laughs> that's the type of game come with cards um uh that's coming later and um a few games in the lucky line our kids game um are coming out uh, but um, yeah, most of the things we release Flying Goblin this year, we release Break the Code this year. Uh, obviously, our dark edition of King of Tokyo has been a huge hit for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a, that's a great title, and it's a, as a reminder for uh, the Roll Roll for Crit viewer, <clears throat> this is a one-time print. So whatever is available in the network right now, it's all that's it that there is. We are not repeating that game. So if you didn't get, if you are a fan of King of Tokyo and you didn't get your collector edition of King of Tokyo, you should really get it before it's becoming super difficult to get it. Big fan, by the way, of the Loki mascot as I used to have a Corgi and now still have a big white Sammy named Loki who is very oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a good combo. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned obviously some of the your releases and things being disrupted we'll say by the current state of the world how have both of you been finding uh the the way things are going right now and have you been approaching you know this new world of online conventions obviously you've been maybe doing some uh remote stuff like this Uh, what do you think about the way it's been being handled by by yourselves or by other people as well you want to speak about it sure um you know for myself um I haven't done any, except for this interview, I haven't done any online conventions yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to do so. I'm hoping we can um, get a, a way to be able to demo Katara uh, for people online with an online implementation. Uh, so that's something we're working on, and I'm hoping we're going to be able to do it at future shows. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, I've been personally really impressed by how much yellow has been able to stick pretty well with the production schedule for Katara. It got put back uh, a couple of months, but really uh, they've been continuing to work and steaming along, which is really impressive in the circumstances. Um, With uh, some other publishers I've been working with, some have had to delay more. Um, One essentially canceled a project with me because they've really had to rethink um, some of their production schedule in light of coronavirus. So um, I've been really pleased that Katara has stayed on track and the work on it has stayed steady throughout. Um, mm-hmm. 
and they've been uh, very good about keeping me in the loop about all of that too. So, you know, as a game designer, I get kind of panicky when <laughs> <laughs> projects get delayed and things. So, uh, the open communication is super helpful. <laughs> Yeah, that's understandable. <laughs> I want to bounce on what Eric says. Um, I, I, as I said, uh, my job come in line later in the life of a product. Once the French team tell me we're going to print, how many do you want, and when are you going to get it? And then that's where I get involved. And when I did that, I reach out to Rick and say, "Hey, listen, you know." We had planned to do, uh, um, have you come to trade shows and, and things like that. And obviously with the virus, it's not going to happen. So let's think outside the box and what can we do? So uh, Eric has been very gracious to uh, work on a, on a Roll20 uh, implementation of Kitara that mm. is, uh, is almost finished that we are we originally we were planning to use it at origins online but unfortunately the show was cancelled um but uh the intention is we want to do a, a yellow uh, event a yellow specific uh, convention kind of event uh later in uh, we think in september or october we haven't figured out exactly the date yet but we're gonna uh, set it up pretty soon and then we will have uh, Eric demoing the game online and we will allow people to play with us and with the demo team. Um, so that will be a, a, an interesting experience. Um, in terms of how Yellow as a company took the, the coronavirus, I think from my observation in the industry, there are two approach. Some people got really concerned and worried and conservative and tried to closing, try to hammer, anchor down to weather the, the, the thing. Mm -hmm. I think we have a different approach. Um, I'm, I'm extremely proactive and I like to get ahead of what's coming instead of reacting. And so um, we, we launched the release, we advanced the release of King of Tokyo Dark by one month. It was supposed to be released in April, but then I said, I talked to my partners in France, said, we are advancing the release. And they were like, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm convinced this is what we need to do. Same thing, I was like, oh my God, business are going to close. What happens if my warehouse is frozen and I can't operate anymore? So I told my, my warehouse crew to ship in urgency two, two shipments of product in two different area in America. So I knew that I had three different location with store inventory. So I could continue to operate if one of my location closed. The day after I did that, my Indiana warehouse closed. Mm -hmm. And so I know uh, some actor of the industry were completely unable to generate any income for April and uh, May because legally the state had uh, forbid them to operate and we didn't want to do anything illegal. So that's why by moving some of our inventory in other, in other state, we were able to continue to work. So, um, and, and in terms of uh, keeping the schedule, I also uh, recommended friends to continue with what we are doing because, yeah, I mean, we don't know when things are going to get normal if they ever get normal at some point or whatever. But um, right. we don't believe that uh, we need games. And also, you know, as as most and most uh, company in the industry are realizing now, people are playing a lot. They are stuck at home. They don't mm -hmm. go out. They don't do anything. So our industry is actually benefiting, as as, as sad as it is to admit, from, yeah. <laughs> from the global pandemic because uh, people are buying games. And so... Uh, it's a good thing to produce game, uh, bearing all the challenges and restriction and, and all that fact. There have been some disruption with the um, uh, shipping routes and all these kind of things, the suppliers, um, the, 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 the company who ship product, you know, UPS, FedEx and USPS have been impacted also. So, but I think, no, I mean, it's, um, we do our best and, uh, and the show must go on. So that's, that's what we do. Yeah. I can't remember, John, whether there's a podcast or a news roundup. We saw something similar about how there was another time where board games actually did well when the rest of the world wasn't doing so hot. I can't remember when it was, but I remember this wasn't the first time we've seen this pattern. 
when the so when the the the, the Wall Street crash happened like ten years ago, um, there was there was an economic slump, and uh, everybody was very worried that people, especially games, are a luxury expense. I mean, you need to buy food and clothes and water to survive. No, you don't. I, 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 I'm just kidding. You need games. I'm just Isn't the hierarchy of needs board games I, I is like the you first need thing? Games to show it's only me. Uh, but so there was a there was a trend of thought saying like, well, people are stop are going to stop going to movies and things like that. And actually, uh, it has been proven that in terms of recession or uh, hardship, the entertainment expenses are striving because people are trying to feel better or to forget or to escape their um, whatever their their concerns are the things that are burdening them and so therefore as an entertainment industry uh, we benefit from that and in the current situation since be called be, since people are stuck at home um, games are doing very well that's exactly what happened with the movie industry in the Great Depression yeah and yeah. Hollywood was thriving in the Great Depression yeah you know I, oh, We'll be the last ones laughing when the nuclear winter hits and Meeple become the new currency that everyone uses. <laughs> oh, there you go. You uh, know, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a more brighter, interesting note. Eric, uh, we do some research, and I noticed on your Board Game Geek page, you actually have clinical psychiatrist uh, on there. Psychologist. Psychologist, sorry. Psychologist. <laughs> that, I should be better considering I uh, majored in neuroscience about not mixing up those words, wow. but I'm terrible. No words. Oh, it's all gone. It's all rotted away. I, I, I replaced it with uh, rule books. But, you know, you I, one of the things you like designed a game, I think it was World of Simon to help yeah. people out. And I'm curious on your thoughts on board games and psychology. Like, how do they mix? Do you think that, that we could use board games to really help people out on that? And does that impact your design philosophy? Okay, so a couple of things. So, um, uh, first of all, when it comes to actual... Uh, deliberately created psychotherapy games like Land of Simon, which is the game uh, I created, actually my first published game. Um, I think certainly board games make a good vehicle for delivering psychoeducational content, psychology content, you know, anything that's sort of a fundamental aspect of human behavior. And of course, board games go all the way back to the earliest civilizations we know. In Ur, they had board games and Old Kingdom. Egypt, they had board games. Mm -hmm. So just like art therapy or other kind of fundamental human behaviors, that makes sort of a good delivery vehicle. Um, as for the therapeutic value of board games in general, not necessarily specifically psychotherapeutic board games, um, I see a lot of things written about it. I haven't seen um, studies that kind of clearly demonstrate some of the benefits people speculate about, like cognitive benefits to stave off memory loss and things like that. Um, hmm. uh, so I'm a researcher, so I really need to see the studies in support of that. But I think as far as mood goes, the simple fact is that board games are fun and uh, they don't, and they're stimulating. And that's enough benefit right there. I don't think they have to have you know, overt cognitive benefits or whatever to be worthwhile. Right now, I think all of us probably need the mood benefits more than we need the cognitive benefits in terms yeah, of our sure. overall well-being. Uh, and I think they're great for that. Um, the uh, fact that the, really a big part of why I selected it as my postgraduate school hobby was I wanted a hobby that was really, I couldn't do by myself. I wanted a hobby that you know, forced me to relate to other people. So I, I can't sort of indulge my own isolative <laughs> tendencies that I sometimes have, which are very easy to indulge right now. Uh, let me say, actually, my isolative tendencies are probably a survival skill uh, at the moment. But uh, the fact is, uh, board gaming forces me to get on Zoom a couple of times a week and, uh, you know, chat with people as I'm playing board games with them and that's where I get a lot of my socialization right now. Um, so I think, uh, they, I think they have a lot of benefits that way. And of course, if you are fortunate enough to be locked down with people who will play board games with you, then I think that's even better. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. may, may, maybe couples need to be a little careful about, um, you know, who beats who too often during the pandemic because <laughs> Uh, got got to keep the peace. But aside from that, I I, mean, I think it's a fabulous, beneficial thing for people. <laughs> yeah, I think you make a lot of great points, and yeah, even even games that, like you said, aren't overtly meant for any kind of therapeutic purposes. They do, you know, just that social aspect of uh, just being at the table or however it is, mm -hmm. uh, being talking to someone. And even just the, you know, whether it's competitive or cooperative, there are there are subtle things, I think, that, that register in, in your unconscious that are healthy, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think. I hope, at least. <laughs> I think so. Oh, no, I, yeah. I mean, I think there are plenty of times when, because of board games, I've been able to catch maybe some of my more uh, negative traits. And because of that, actually try to work on them. Mm-hmm. I, I think so. And, you know, one of the things that gets tough when you are locked down with the same group of people all day, every day, is you run out of things to say to each other. Uh, even, you know, people like my uh, family that I call maybe once or twice a week, we run out of, it, it gets hard to keep a conversation because not that much is happening to me right now. I don't have that much news to report. I don't go outside. So um, very much the, you know, where one of the ways board games are, ordinary board games are typically used in psychotherapy is when you're working with kids or teenagers, it's really too taxing for them to sit and try to carry on a therapeutic conversation for an hour. So if you're doing something like playing a board game, then some of the time they can just be playing the board game. And then when they have um, something to put into the therapy you know, conversation, they can take their time and put it in. I think for people who are locked down, it can be very much the same thing. The board gaming gives you something to do that's still social, that's still interactive. You can talk about the board game itself, and it kind of takes the pressure off to come up with novel things to talk about when you've been locked down together for so long and you have so little kind of outside stimulus. Yeah, I know for a lot of people, the generic starter might be, so how's it about that sports team? A little hard <laughs> to answer that question right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. How's your health? Yeah. You know, all those are, are, are pretty loaded these days. <laughs> Still alive. Yeah. <laughs> we I've definitely used board games as a as a crutch for to to help aid uh, social progress, <laughs> as it were. Uh, so it's really fascinating talking to you more about uh, your design process. Uh, as we said, Katara is the new game. Where and when and how can people uh, purchase Katara? So Katara is going to be available uh, in October. The actual street date for the game is October 22 uh, at retail store uh, nationwide. And then the online date is going to be November 5. So you can pre-order it online, but uh, you won't be able to get shipped until November 5th. So if you are really itching to play that beautiful game, uh, you need to contact your local game store and you can play it uh, two weeks earlier on October 22. And it's going to retail for $35. All right. That's very nice. And like you guys said, you're working on your own little yellow uh, online thing. Hoping, yeah. I think you said September. So yes. that's another way you can maybe see more of it later on. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we'll. Uh, I, I haven't. Uh, we haven't uh, designed the, the the organization of the schedule, but uh, obviously we will have designer uh, partner and friend like Eric attending. Um, but we will also uh, would love to have people like you guys coming and say hi or participate. Or uh, again, it's like a, it's like a yellow day, you know, like a yellow yellow convention, uh, but virtual. Uh, I. I got a new office with uh, cameras and things, and we're ready to do that. So uh, we uh, will, will, will do this. That's it's one of the things that coronavirus has uh, accelerated for us. Is we had always that in the back of our mind, but obviously now we we have a stronger need for it. Yeah, I, mean, I similar for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the new normal. But yep. we've we've enjoyed you know seeing a, a couple other companies here and there have started to do like these kinds of. Uh, their own personal little online showings, and it, it can be. There's a silver lining to it for sure. It's, it can create some really fun opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. uh, I think when this is 
when this is all over, when I actually get my <laughs> shot of the coronavirus vaccine, I'm planning to spend at least a couple of months when I don't go online at all for any reason. <laughs> But after Fair that, enough. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. But I think over the long run, this is probably this experience is going to increase the amount of the game world that happens online because just more people have been introduced to playing games that way, to interacting that way. It's probably going to become just part of our repertoire. Yeah, maybe designing games that way, too. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm trying to figure out some ways to do uh, play testing online at this point because... Uh, I don't want to go till what, till January, till who knows, without playtesting games anymore. So I've got to get that together. And I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to get past my own kind of learning curve with some of those online systems to make it happen. Roll20 is the one I've been working on, but, you know, probably need a variety of them. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, you mentioned this, and as you all are watching now in our uh, Gen Con online stream videos and streams <laughs> that we're hoping that because of this, there's going to be not just like we dump all this next year when we can all meet in person. It's sort of a combination. That way we get more people into the hobby because it's more accessible, which means more people then have ex can experience your games, which means they can then spread it. So I'm at least hopeful there. Yeah. 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 Same here. Well, thank you so much. We are we are looking forward to hopefully the best possible future and looking forward to Katara, which uh, looks like it's going to be a great addition to what is already a pretty full lineup of games from Yellow. Uh, thanks to both of you for taking the time to chat with us today. And hopefully we'll get to see you again and talk to you again uh, soon, maybe during the, the Yellow convention uh, in September. I hope so. Come play Katara with me there. I don't want to be lonely. Come on out. <laughs> yeah, thanks. that sounds like fun. <laughs> thanks for having us. Uh, it was it was nice to hang out with you guys, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the next time we can actually be physically in the same location together. Oh yeah, yes, definitely. Yes, we all are. Well, thanks everyone at home for watching, and until our next video comes out, this is Roll for Crit. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Always got a wave. Thanks to all our members of our Patreon page for making this show possible. You can sign up for exclusive benefits or help us by liking and subscribing. You can also take a quick survey to help us improve Roll for Crit. And in exchange, you'll receive access to a Patreon exclusive podcast episode. Stay up to date on all our Gen Con online coverage, including live gameplay at RollForCrit.com.